journalists anywhere under any circumstances. Um, that's just uh, that's completely unacceptable. It's antithetical to uh, the very principles of democracy that uh, that, that, that you're right uh, were on display last week uh, during the state visit. Go ahead, Richard. Thank you, uh, Kirby. Um, so, do you agree that the counteroffensive, the Ukraine counteroffensive, has gone more slowly than expected? And do you feel? Do you? analyze that um, considering the uh, Wagner group will be busy doing something else that it will help this counter offense I don't know what the Wagner group's going to be busy doing here again I think it's too soon to Amr's question it's just too soon to know how this is going to play out whether uh, in Africa or elsewhere certainly in Ukraine and I am not uh, I have said before and I'll say it again today I'm not going to do armchair quarterback into the counteroffensive from uh, from this podium that's up to President Zelensky to speak to they our focus is on making sure that they have what they need to succeed, whether it's training, tools, equipment. And you're going to see uh, another round of support announced from this administration for Ukraine in terms of weapons and capabilities this week. So we are focused on that. That's that's what uh, that's where our heads are. And just to make sure, Kirby, that I understand well, the NSC. How much did the NSC knew about the development, the, the development of this of this uh, uh, Wagner movement towards Moscow before it started? Yeah, as I think I mentioned to, to Kelly, the, the dispute and the tension between Wagner and the Russian Ministry of Defense was widely known. Uh, it was public. Rolling towards Moscow. It, it was all, all that tension was public. I'm not going to talk about intelligence matters. Thank you. Thank you. No, go ahead, Ed, and then we'll go to the back. Okay. Ed goes first. Thank you, John. Thank you for doing this. So, what should we call what transpired over the weekend? I think, uh, Is it a mutiny? coup or attempted coup in armed rebellion? We're not slapping a bumper sticker on it, Ed. Um, in the U.S. assessment, was the objective ever really to directly threaten Putin or the Kremlin? I'm sorry, can you say that again? In the U.S.'s assessment, was it ever the Wagner Group's intent to directly target Putin or the Kremlin? Uh, again, I would let the parties speak for themselves here in terms of what transpired and what motivations they're were for these actions. That's not something that we could accurately or even appropriately speak to. What I can speak to is we made sure that we lashed up early and have stayed lashed up with our allies and partners to make sure we all have the same kind of perspective on this and we're approaching it from the same way, um, and that we made appro appropriate communications with the Russians about our, their obligations to protect our diplomats and to make sure that they knew we weren't involved. You were describing early attempts to communicate with the Russians about what happened. Did they respond in real time to any of that outreach? There were appropriate diplomatic discussions that occurred over the course of the weekend, again, to send those two messages. So is the U.S. confident the Russians would be responsive in the event of a nuclear or other real crisis, given how they were this weekend? I would just tell you, Ed, uh, and this has been the case for the last 16 months, I mean, Russia is a nuclear power, that we have been monitoring as best we can Russian strategic posture, their nuclear capabilities. That continues. And we've seen no indication. Outside of the blustery rhetoric, we've seen no indication uh, that there's any intent to use nuclear weapons inside Ukraine. And I can also assure you that we've done nothing, we've seen nothing that would that would compel us to change our own strategic deterrent posture. But just given how the interactions went over the weekend, you're confident they'd respond in real time if there was some other kind of... We had, we had good, uh, direct communications with the Russians over the course of the weekend. It's our expectation that that would be able to continue going forward. Just to button up real quick, given all that interaction this weekend, what you guys have seen, can you say right now who's in charge of the Russian military? The Russian military, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I, I wouldn't, it's not my job to speak for another military, uh, but there's absolutely no indication uh, that there's been any changes that we've seen in the chain of command for the Russian military forces. John, you're back. Thanks, Corrine. Uh, John, um, the NATO summit is just a few weeks away. How have the events of this past weekend in any way changed or modified the agenda for the NATO summit? I think it's, again, too soon here. This just happened over the weekend. So uh, I think I'd be fibbing to you if I told you that there was some sort of big agenda item uh, changed because of what happened over the weekend. We'll, we'll have to see how this plays out. Uh, it's just too soon to know what the impacts are. Uh, it's going to be an important NATO summit 
regardless, because we are now, you know, almost a year and a half into war here in Ukraine. Uh, we've got a new NATO member uh, in Finland and hopefully soon uh, a 32nd member. Uh, so there's an awful lot on the agenda to speak to, and it's a critical time for the alliance. The president's looking forward to it. Okay. The administration subscribed to the view uh, as it relates to Russian leadership, uh, who uh, essentially leads that country that the devil you know is better than the devil that you don't know? I'm not sure I completely understand the, the, the question, but let me tack it this way. And if I'm wrong, because I, I okay, you, you lost me there a little bit on well, the devil stuff. Well, I, I'm sorry to get into that. I was just simply saying, would you prefer to have Vladimir Putin leading Russia or an entity like the Wagner Group or someone uh, named from the Wagner Group leading the Russian government? We believe it's up to the Russian people to determine who their leadership is. And we would prefer uh, to see uh, uh, Russia not invade their neighboring countries. Uh, we would prefer to see Russia, since they already did that, remove all their troops from Ukraine uh, and end the war today, which they could do. That's what we prefer. Justin. Thanks. Uh, John, you said a number of times you've declined to comment on you know, Putin's grip on power in Russia by saying it's an internal Russian matter. Is that a deliberate decision by the U.S. government to avoid contributing to the notion that the U.S. was somehow behind this? Or does the White House simply not have an assessment at this moment of his grip on power? Uh, we're just not going to involve ourselves uh, in speaking to uh, an internal domestic uh, Russian issue right now. Uh, we're staying focused on supporting Ukraine. Um, and the, I just want to disavow you of any idea that the reason why we're saying we weren't involved has something to do with not wanting to comment about the situation in Moscow and Mr. Putin's leadership. It, it, it was important to say it for the, on the face of it, that we weren't involved and we have no intention of being involved. What we are going to be involved in is supporting Ukraine. There's been uh, you know, Brent crude increase this morning. There was a uh, higher uh, European natural gas prices. Uh, how closely is the administration monitoring uh, potential energy price shocks as a result of instability in Russia? Been watching it since the beginning of the war, actually before the beginning of the war, and we'll continue to do that. April, John, I want to kind of get into the weeds um, off of Jeff's question on weakness. Are you concerned about the instability in Russia because of? The nuclear capability, if they have to come out stronger, they could use that. Is that the reason for your uh, concern about instability? I think you got to take a broader view of that, April. I mean, uh, the, the reason we're, we're, we would be concerned about instability in Russia is uh, the war in Ukraine predominantly. Yes, Russia is a nuclear power, and yes, that's of concern, and yes, we continue to monitor that. But I mean, I just think you, if, you, if you look at, uh, at the scope of, of recent events, again, over the past year and a half, um, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about stability in Russia and the impact that that could have on the Ukrainian people and on the European continent. And, and as you said, over the last year and a half, going back to what Jeff said, this administration acknowledged that they were shocked that it took Russia so long. They have not shown to be the power, the military might, that everyone thought they were. And then what happens this weekend, does it show cracks in Russia's military might and who they are as we perceive them? Yeah, I, again, I'm not going to... We're, we're not going to characterize uh, the, the events of the weekend or be able to contextualize it for you beyond what we've said before. It's just too soon to know what impacts this is going to have um, on Ukraine uh, and on Russia, quite frankly, throughout Europe. It's just too soon to know. Um, but broadly speaking, I mean, we're now in 16 months of war, a, a war that was advertised by the Russian side as only going to be taken a few days. Uh, and now we're 16 months into it. Uh, clearly, you don't need me to tell you, but the, the history of this conflict has shown that the Russian military is not as, as vaunted as perhaps uh, they wanted to characterize themselves as. But, and this is a big but, and I think it's an important point to make, um, uh, as Ukraine uh, conducts offensive operations this summer to claw back some of that territory, they are running into a Russian defense, um, and uh, the Russians have invested in those defensive capabilities. Uh, and so, as I said in my opening statement, casualties are being taken on both sides. There's a lot of active fighting right now in the east and the south of the country. And again, not to sound like a broken record, but what we're trying to do is make sure that the Ukrainians have everything they need to be successful in that fight. Good job. 
John, is the president at all disappointed that this episode came and went and Vladimir Putin is still in power? The president is focused on supporting Ukraine. Uh, we didn't, we're not taking sides in this internal matter. Uh, the president is going to make sure that we're staying focused on Ukraine. He did say, though, in March 2022, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Regime this change. might have changed that. Regime change is not our policy. We've been very, very clear about that. Uh, what we're focused on is making sure Ukraine can succeed on the battlefield. What was his demeanor like when he was getting the hour-to-hour -hour updates? Uh, look, I wasn't with the president when he was getting these, so I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak to his demeanor. Uh, uh, as you know, the president um, uh, very keenly tracks foreign policy developments around the world. His national security team was gi giving him updates literally hour by hour throughout the weekend, um, and he was absorbing all that information and making sure that in the context of absorbing it, he was also sharing our perspectives with allies and partners. And as I said, those conversations, uh, they did, it wasn't just one and done. He's had several over the course of the last couple of uh, days, and you're going to see that continue going forward. And one last one on the, on the conversations with our allies. You had said um, we were not going to get involved in these events. Um, we would not at any point. But if this had turned to a nuclear situation, what was the conversation with our allies about how that would be addressed? I wouldn't speculate on hypotheticals, Jackie. I, I, I wouldn't get into hypotheticals. They were talking about the situation as we were seeing it unfold. They were communicating with each other, our allies and partners, about their perspectives, what they were seeing, what we were seeing, sharing as much context as we could, um, and making sure that we all had sort of the same sight picture uh, and that we were uh, basically all reacting in real time in roughly the same way. It was important for that, uh, for that to be the case. And so that's really where the focus was. Uh, on the nuclear thing, I mean, again, I'm not going to hypothesize here, but we continue to watch this very, very closely. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of reckless rhetoric coming out of the Russian side. We watch it closely. We just have seen no indication that Mr. Putin uh, has any intention of using nuclear weapons inside Ukraine or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and I can assure you we have done nothing to change our own strategic deterrent posture when it comes to that, to that potential threat. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just on Prigozhin's status, uh, does the U.S. have any uh, assessment on whether his safety was insured as part of this deal, or is there a belief that his life could be in jeopardy? We don't know the parameters of this deal. We weren't a party to it. Uh, I'd point you to the parties to it to, to speak to the, the details of it. We just don't have visibility on that. And then just in terms of the war itself, uh, do you have an assessment of just how much, to what extent, the Wagner's forces have been diluted in Ukraine and what that might mean for the Ukrainian troops? Diluted with a D or diluted with a T? Just in terms of this, the size of the force in Ukraine now, as you know, as opposed to uh, last. Oh, it means siphoned off. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, it's unclear uh, right now where the bulk of the Wagner forces are. I mean, we've seen some reporting, um, mostly through uh, press and social media, that uh, that many of them moved back across into Ukraine. Uh, but we're not in a position to verify or validate those reports. So it's, it's really unclear where they all are and where they all might go or what they might do in, in terms of the future. Um, un, it's in, in disputed, of, of course, undisputed, of course, that Wagner played a role, particularly in the fight for Bakhmut. Um, they were reinforced by Russian military forces, and that had a, a major factor on their ability to, to take that town. Um, but as I have said, many, many times. I mean, Wagner's approach here was just to throw bodies at the fight, largely ill-trained, ill-equipped, um, and poorly led, but just body after body after body. And they suffered a lot, tens of thousands of casualties just tra just taking back moot, uh, all for a town, which I've also said uh, didn't have any strategic value to the Russians one way or another. Nadia, thank you. Uh, can you confirm that Mr. Prokhorjian is in Belarus no. as Senator uh, Warner? seem to indicate. I cannot. Okay. Uh, can you give us your assessment of the group? Can it survive without him? Or do you think that he was a central figure, that he was able to control it, all its operation yeah. whether it's in Ukraine or in Africa? I think I'd give you the same answer I gave Amr. It's just too soon to know what the future of Wagner is going to be. We're going to stay focused on the group. Of course, we have to. Uh, they, they do operate outside. Uh, of Ukraine, and uh, we have levied uh, uh, lots of sanctions against them, and we'll continue to hold them accountable as, as appropriate. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, John. 
Um, earlier today, President Biden said that he would be speaking with additional heads of state this afternoon. I wonder if you can give us any details about who, the substance, the timber of those conversations, about whether what he's trying to convey today is different or yeah. evolving from what he's trying to convey over the, the weekend. The call that uh, he was alluding to earlier uh, is to the Prime Minister of Italy, uh, Prime Minister Maloney. And that call should be taking place just about now. We'll give you a readout when it's over. But it'll be very much in keeping with the kinds of readouts you've seen over the last 48 hours. John, um, Prigozhin, in his first message since all this came down, went down, said that he wanted to avoid Russian bloodshed and that he marched in a demonstration of protests uh, not to overturn power in the country. Does the U.S. buy that? We're not taking a position on Mr. Prigozhin's motivations. And then secondly, has the U.S. been able to corroborate uh, the allegations that Prigozhin made that he says were the pretext for this uh, attempted insurrection? He said that 30 Wagner fighters died after a Russian military attack on their position on Friday. You cannot confirm those reports. And then lastly, um, do, you, do you have any I know you've said that you have no idea where Prigozhin is right now. Is that correct? That's correct. What's your What's your sense of where this goes? Do you believe that this is over now? That his attempted insurrection failed? It's not going to restart again? Or are you still monitoring for the possibility that Wagner fighters might attempt something like this again? We don't know. We don't know where this goes, uh, or whether this is really the end. Which is why we are going to continue to monitor it, and why the president is still getting uh, routinely updated and, and will in the coming days. And very quickly, do you have any sense of whether Ukraine was able to take advantage of this chaos uh, over, over the weekend? I'm not sure what you mean by take advantage of it. Take advantage in, from a military standpoint in terms of their offensive in the east of Ukraine. Again, I would let the Ukrainians speak to their military operations. All I would say, and, I, and, and it's why I wanted to put it right up top when I started here, is that there's a lot of fighting going on in the east and south of Ukraine. They are still trying to get uh, the territory back from the Russians, and they are still inflicting and taking casualties. So the fight goes on. Now, how much and to what degree, it, in any given area, that fighting was adjusted or changed, slowed down or sped up as a result of the weekend, I just couldn't speak to it. Certainly nothing discernible from our perspective, but again, the uh, Ukrainians would have to speak to their operations. Um, earlier today, the President said that he and allies had talked about um, planning for several different scenarios over the course of the weekend. Could you speak to some of those scenarios? No. <laughs> um, and he and President Zelensky have communicated yesterday. Have they spoken today? Uh, can you give us a sense of their conversations? There has not been another conversation with President Zelensky since the, the, the one that we've already read out to you that occurred yesterday. Um, but as you heard the president say, he does expect to be speaking again with President Zelensky very, very soon. And of course, we'll weed that out to you when it happens, as we always do. Thanks, John. Uh, the president uh, earlier today and you here have broadcast the message that was sent by the West privately to Putin. Is there a message that you would send publicly to the people of Russia? This says, it, I, I think, you know, the best thing I could do is point you back to the, the president's speech uh, when we went to Warsaw. Uh, several months ago, and he had a whole section in there about the Russian people, and uh, and that would still be our message today. That, that this is our issue with what Russia is doing in Ukraine is with the Kremlin and the Russian military, and of course their enablers such as the Wagner Group. It's not with the Russian people. Um, it, it, it's not with the, the men, women, and children that live in that country, and um, and who didn't make this rash and reckless and illegal decision to invade a neighboring country in a completely unprovoked way. Catanita. Thank you. Um, can we just talk about the White House's assessment of other nations' reactions to whatever we're calling this thing over the weekend, specifically Tehran's reaction, Beijing's reaction, and um, New Delhi? Did, did Washington engage with any of those three? And then also, we know that the NSC had meetings in Copenhagen this weekend with BRICS countries. Has, can you just tell us what came out of that and whether they've adjusted their posture on this? So on your first question, uh, as we have these uh, conversations, certainly at the president's level or at the cabinet level, they will be read out to you. So I don't have any other conversations to speak to. And I certainly would not get into the business of characterizing another country's attitudes or reflections or perspectives. They can speak for themselves. Uh, we've been very focused on how we're looking at this and, um, and how we're tracking things. 
Um, on the uh, on the meeting in uh, Copenhagen, I think you know uh, the National Security Advisor attended virtually, and Senior Director for Europe Amanda Sloat was there in person in Copenhagen. It was a meeting uh, uh, called by the Ukrainians, hosted by uh, Denmark, but it was a Ukrainian meeting, uh, and it was really about uh, having a discussion. Uh, about the principles of peace and this idea of a just peace and where that can go and what's the right next steps to try to achieve uh, a just peace uh, in Ukraine. And it was uh, a valuable discussion, uh, I'm told productive, uh, and uh, uh, in a, in a you know, good variety of, of countries that, that were there, representing you know, places from all over the world. Again, I'd let those countries speak for their participation and their takeaways. But our takeaway was it was, uh, it, it was worth the time and worth having that discussion. Good in the White House. Thank you, Karine. Uh, thank you, Admiral. What does the White House make of, it's on the Middle East, uh, what does the White House make of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's call today to eradicate the idea of establishing a Palestinian state and uh, to cut off the Palestinian uh, aspirations regarding establishing one? I haven't seen those comments, so um, uh, I'm going to refrain from a specific reaction to them until I've had a chance to see them and uh, and look at them and discuss that with uh, with the rest of the team. I will only say that the, the president remains committed to uh, the value and the viability of a two-state solution. There is some concern in such countries like Poland and Lithuania, uh, neighboring Belarus about possible movement of Wagner's troop to Belarus. You just said that you don't know where they are, but will you be able to track them? And if there is a movement of Wagner's group's soldiers to Belarus, uh, would it require strengthening eastern fl flank of NATO, just in case? And uh, on another topic, is there any movement on Sweden's uh, membership to NATO, are there any signs that may suggest that Sweden may join NATO before Vilnius summit? The president's still optimistic that they will. Uh, we look forward to welcoming them in the alliance. The conversations between Sweden and Turkey continue. We encourage that dialogue, uh, and we hope that uh, it will very soon come to a, a positive conclusion. On your first question, uh, we, we just don't know what the future is here for Wagner. and and where those troops are going to go, what they're going to do, we just don't know. So this idea of tracking them, I mean, I, I, I couldn't begin to answer that question for you uh, with specificity. What we are going to track is what's going on inside Ukraine, and, and we're going to make sure that we're also in constant communication with the Ukrainians about what they need to be successful. That's where the focus is. Now, on your question about the eastern flank, we have already bolstered the eastern flank. President Biden ordered an additional 20,000 American troops uh, to the eastern flank of NATO, and they have stayed there. So we now have about 100,000 American troops uh, on the European continent, the most since, you know, World War II. Uh, and uh, that's a significant presence, and we're going to continue to evaluate that with our allies uh, along that flank. To, you know, if we have to adjust, we'll, we'll adjust. But there's already been a significant contribution by the United States to the, to the eastern flank of NATO. concerns about security of uh, NATO summit in Vilnius. If Wagner's troops uh, move to Brett, Belarus? Uh, again, I, that's a hypothetical I can't possibly answer in terms of where they're going to go. But we're looking forward to a productive NATO summit, and of course, uh, security for summits like that are always a prime concern for all the nations involved. Thanks. A couple questions. Um, the fact that this Wagner convoy could travel a main highway without being stopped by any kind of air power, does that reflect to you any kind of issues with Russian command and control? I, I can't speak to that. Secondly, in terms of the kind of Ukrainian counteroffensive, um, what's your assessment of the pace of how that's going? Is that going slower than it should be? President Zelensky himself, I think, spoke publicly last week, saying that uh, uh, you know that it's it's going slower in some areas than uh, than he would have liked. He's the commander in chief. You know, he gets to make those determinations and he gets to give those orders. Um, as I said earlier, the Russians have invested a lot in the last six eight months in terms of defensive capabilities. Um, in some cases, their defensive lines are three deep. And by three deep, I don't mean just three feet. I mean miles and miles and miles deep, but three big lines of uh, defense. Um, they knew that the Ukrainians were going, 
going to want to take back territory in the spring and summer months, and they and they work to prepare it. Um, and defense, as any military history student will tell you, defense is the stronger form of war. Uh, and so the Ukrainians are running into Russian defenses. Um, and it and by President Zelensky's own in his own analysis, it it has uh, it has slowed them down a little bit. Is there a possibility or even a hope on the U.S. side here that? The instability that we're seeing kind of in Russia between this and Wagner, that that weakens, I guess, the Russian defense. Again, too soon to know. Just too soon to know. There's a couple more things. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Admiral. Uh, so can you please expand on the early assessments from the U.S. on the impact of the developments in Russia on the war in Ukraine and whether it signals the beginning of the end for the war? Uh, again, I, I think it's... Uh, not to sound like a, a broken record, but it's just too soon to know what the impact uh, to the war in Ukraine is going to be as a result of the events over the last weekend. Um, and I, I just don't know that it would be helpful to speculate that. I, I do want to keep centering you, though, and reminding you that there are tens of thousands of Russian troops and vehicles and capabilities, air and ground, in fact, and sea, uh, that they have still available to them to try to defend against Ukrainian offensive operations, and they are doing that. I mean, even as all this stuff happened over the course of the weekend, there was fighting inside Ukraine from these two forces. How concerned are you at this point that Putin could take any more extreme measures to demonstrate his control? That's going to be a decision for Vladimir Putin to make, and I wouldn't begin to speculate about what that might be. We have been watching uh, uh, Russian actions and leadership since the beginning of the, actually before the beginning of the war. Um, and one thing that we have uh, always talked about, unabashedly so, is that it's in nobody's interest for this war to escalate beyond the level of violence it has already visited upon the Ukrainian people. That's not good for, certainly Ukraine, not good for uh, uh, our allies and partners in Europe. Quite frankly, it's not good for the Russian people. Dan Sebastian. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, during, this, during this whole drama, was the administration uh, happy, content that all the nuclear weapons in Russia were like totally under control the whole time, or was that actually something that was beginning to worry people over on this side, um, given the chaos and briefly actual complete no one having a clue who's in charge anymore? Happy and content are two words I don't normally associate with monitoring nuclear activity. Uh, not us. Uh, look, we monitor this very closely. And all I can tell you is uh, that we've seen no indication that Mr. Putin is interested in moving in that direction, uh, and nor have we seen anything that would cause us to change our own deterrent posture. That's really as far as I can go on that. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean a question on Mr. Putin, but, but rather there, there, were, there was a period of however many it was, 12, 16, 18 hours, where actually no one was totally sure who was in charge and is still a nuclear-armed country, so that period. As I said, instability in Russia is something that, you know, we would take seriously, and we certainly had lots of questions over the course of the weekend, as did you, about the situation in Russia and the issue of stability. Um, and we did have, and were able to have uh, in real time, uh, through diplomatic channels, conversations with Russian officials um, about, uh, about our concerns. I think I just have to leave it at that. Given the, the role that uh, Belarus appeared to play, at least in ending this uprising, it, does that give any new insight from your vantage point on the relationship between Putin and Lukashenko? I don't think so. I mean, uh, Lukashenko and, and Belarus have, you know, basically been a, a surrogate for uh, Mr. Putin and for Russia uh, for quite some time, certainly before this war started. And Belarus has, even though they have not actively involve themselves in the fighting. They have certainly uh, allowed Belarusian soil to be used for staging activities, for the launching of attacks inside uh, Ukraine, for the storage of, of, uh, of uh, Russian capabilities. I mean, they have, they have been an enabler for, for Mr. Putin. So I don't know that there was a lot of shock or surprise that, uh, that Mr. Lukashenko got involved. But again, I'd, I'd let those parties speak to that. Last question, Wayne, about the middle. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you, John. Um, do you believe this uh, instability in Russia uh, will have an impact on Beijing's relations with Moscow? Do you hope that China's support for the Kremlin will decline as a result we, of this? I let, we'll let P the PRC 
and President Xi speak for himself. Uh, we don't want to see any country at all support Mr. Putin and make it easier for him to kill more Ukrainians. We want to see every country around the world sign up and actually implement the sanctions that are in place, the international sanctions, uh, uh, not provide any uh, ability uh, for Mr. Putin to continue to operate his, his war machine. And we have communicated that not just to the PRC, but to, to other countries all, all around the world. Now, what they do about this is going to be for them to speak to. All I can do is tell you what President Biden's focused on, and that's making sure, A, we're staying abreast of what's going on, um, and that the Ukrainians know nothing's going to change about our support. Uh, uh, according to reports, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is expected to visit China next month. Uh, do you have any reaction? I haven't seen those reports, but obviously uh, he's the elected leader, uh, uh, prime minister of uh, Israel. He gets to speak for his travel habits and where he goes and who he wants to talk to, and um, and that'll be up for that'll be up for them to, to talk about. Thanks. Thanks. Was this Thanks, intelligence Thanks. failure, John? You guys you guys you guys Chinese group in Cuba. Um, so there's one thing I just want to address really quickly, um, which I think is really important. It goes to Kelly O's question about um, Sabrina and what she has been dealing with. Uh, since Thursday, so I just want to just reiterate a little bit what John said is that we're, we're certainly here at the White House under this administration. We're committed to, uh, to the freedom of the press, uh, which, is, uh, which is why we had the press conference last week. So just want to remind folks that's why we had the press conference last week. And just to also just repeat what you just all heard from my colleague, uh, we have certainly uh, condemned any efforts of intimidation or harassment of a journalist or any journalist that is just trying to do their job. And so I just want to, I just want to be very clear about that. discriminating against me for the past nine Please months. Stop. How is she discriminating against you? No, she, she, she called on you. She just gave you a few questions. I just need a question, question in nine months. Just ask a question. Please. Go ahead, Allow me to do my up. job and ask my question. Okay, when you say that you're a journalist, I've been explaining again. Okay. Been in this if this continues, we're going to end the press briefing. I've been in this if this continues, continues to ask you stop. you're being stop. incredibly stop. rude. Stop. Stop. You're pretty rude. rude. You're being incredibly rude. You're, you're talking this over this your colleague. Press. You're not applying you're talking, this You're talking over your colleague. I'm not talking over the colleagues that I'd like to ask. When President Biden forgave the student debt, the administration booked a $400 billion cost. Uh, that added to the deficit at the end of last fiscal year. How does the administra administration plan to look at this issue given the pending uh, court decision? Will you book the deficit reduction in debt forgiveness or uh, will it stay in hopes of challenging the ruling? So look, I'm not going to get ahead of the ruling, right? We, we, are, we're, we are very confident uh, that we are on, that uh, the law is on our side here. Uh, and, uh, and so certainly not going to get in ahead of what is going to happen and what uh, the Supreme Court is going, to, uh, is going to rule. We are confident in our legal authorities, as we said over and over again. And as you all know, and I think I've said this before, that the solic Solicitor General uh, made a compelling argument uh, before the co court, so we're certainly not going to get ahead of this decision. Look, when it comes to the deficit, this is a president, and he's shown this by his action on how much he takes lowering the deficit, decreasing the deficit, uh, makes that a priority. We've seen that in a record number, $1.7 trillion uh, in, in the first two years. That is something because of the, what the President has put forward in his economic policies, he's been able to do that. And in the budget negotiation that you all covered and saw, uh, one of the things that he made sure is that that budget negotiation uh, lowered the deficit by another trillion dollars. So this is something that the President certainly cares about. Uh, and certainly has taken action uh, and moved forward with making sure that his economic policy does just that. Look, when, more broadly, as it relates to the student loan, we, we've been very clear. We think it is certainly important as people, as we're coming out of this pandemic, to give folks, and the pause is going to be lifted, as we all know, in August, uh, to, to make sure that we give Americans and American families a little bit breathing room. That is what this does. And because of this, it is actually going to be able to bring, put money back into the economy. If you think about people being able to buy a home now, if you think about people being able to actually do more uh, with this burden that they've been carrying uh, and they've had to deal with. So we think it's part of that economic policy of agenda to make sure that we are uh, not leaving anybody behind, but also building an economy. Uh, Please join the conversation. Uh, put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel.
You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the Macad TV family. Please like and share Macad TV. We love you all. Please support Macad TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.